Father, we just thank you for an opportunity to come here today, Lord, and minister your word, Father God. We thank you that the anointing is here, that the words come out of my mouth will be yours and not mine, Father, and it will be for the benefit of you. And we thank you for these young kids, Father God. Even little Cambria sees her sister has two flags. She has to have two, and she made it work. We just thank you because they are the church of the future. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, I think Pastor Bob and Debbie are in Indiana this morning. I don't think they've made it to Kentucky yet. Um, we will be leaving going down in the morning for the week. We will be back next week, so Pastor Bob and Deb will not, but soon I'll be back next weekend. Looking forward to a good week down there this week. Some good word. Trying to get my notes lined up here. You know, God's got a sense of humor. I was just about ready to make a phone call last yesterday afternoon. I didn't know if I was going to call Pastor Vince or Pastor Rob, but somebody's about to get a phone call and say, you're up tomorrow, because I got nothing. <laughs> I mean, all week long, I'm like, come on, this is not funny, Lord. Time's running out. <laughs> so finally, about 4 o'clock, my wife looks up and she goes, I'm not worried about it. She goes, you'll have something. And... Uh, about 4 o'clock, God started giving me a little, little schooling. Speaking of schooling, Ministry of Helps. If you go in and you read the, the list of the gifts, you will find that helps is a gift. It is a ministry. It is probably one of the best classes I've ever been in. The book, the author of this book is phenomenal. He points out so many things. And sometimes we think that, this has nothing to do with my message, but sometimes we think of helps as just some mediocre thing. There's a man that some of you may remember. He, uh, this guy played with Eric Clapton and Pete Townsend and Little Richard. I mean, he played with Elton John. He played with some of the kings. And... He walked away from making $100,000 every 45 minutes, became a Christian, and became, he went from there to being a janitor in a church. That's humbling. Ministry of helps. But he proved to his pastor and he proved to God that he was sincere, that he was giving his life to God and he would do whatever he wanted to. The pastor that he had just happened to be Kenneth Copeland. That same man today, his name is Mylon Lefevre. He went on to form a band in the 80s called Broken Heart that won Dove Awards that brought over 200,000 kids to Christ. He's 74, 75 years old. Him, him and his wife are still traveling around the globe ministering today. They're doing it on the Harleys now. They're not doing it with music. So, But the point I'm getting at is There's nothing in the ministry of helps that's mediocre. If you're willing to submit yourself, it could be just a stepping stone to something else. That's a freebie. That had nothing to do with today's message. Today, I heard somebody talking about this here a week or so ago, and it just kind of kept coming back and coming back. So today, I want to talk to you a little bit about your identity, understanding who you are. Psychology says there are three things that make you or form the person that you are. There's actually, I discovered, a few more than that, but we won't get into them. But the three main things we're going to go over today, and then I'm going to give you a fourth one that psychology does not recognize and does not teach, and yet it is the most powerful of the identifiers. Number one is genetic determinism. Genetic determinism says, I am what I am, because of my parents or the hereditary features in my family. I am who I am because who I came from. And there's a lot of truth to that. And there's a lot of names that can be connected to various nationalities that can have negative impacts on you. Um, we all know some of them. To my Italian brothers and sisters, a lot of them when they were younger, they had a cute little nickname for Italian. It's called WAPS. How'd you like to be a child in school and always referred to as a WAP? But that comes with 
That, that comes with a genetic determinism. But thanks to DNA testing today, we're finding out there's nobody 100%. People that thought they were 100% this or 100% that, DNA has proven they are not. There is no one that is 100% unless you're born into Christ. When you're born into God, you're 100%, 100% in the likeness of Christ living inside of you. Genetic determinism is a prob problematic phil Philosophy because it reduces the self to a modular entity equating human beings and all their social, historical, and moral complexes with their genes. And yes, I do have to read some notes today because I can't memorize all this. So you have to bear with me. The second thing we want to talk about that makes you who you are is psychic determinism. And this is one that's come alive in the last decade. Psychic determinism is simply this. I am what I am because that's what I think I am. I think on it all the time and my experience has been. So psychic determinism theorizes that all mental processes are not spontaneous but are determined by the unconscious or pre-existing mental complexes. And man, do we see a lot of that going on today. There's people that are walking around out there, well, I'm this, I'm that. Well, biologically, they're not. There is no truth to it. But we're being told that this is now a determining factor in who they are. So we have to recognize that even though it's not true, they believe it, so it must be true. We've thought on something so long for us of our life that it actually believe it's true. Remember when you as a kid, to show you how easy this works, my son's back there, so I'm not going to pick on him too much today. But remember when you was a kid, we've all done this. You remember that little lie that we told to get attention? It worked. We had attention. So we told it again somewhere else. And again somewhere else. And somewhere again somewhere else. And then somewhere down the line, we told that lie so many times, we had to stop and think. Did that really happen or did I make that up? There's a lot of people out there living lies that they made up as a child. It's easy. If you think on something long enough, you'll believe it's actually true, regardless if it is or not. And that's what psychic determinism, it, determinism is. I am what I am because I've thought on it so long that it's absolute truth. This book I've been reading by, uh, we've been reading by Mark Batterson. He talks about switching to script. Okay, let's switch the script here for a moment. What would happen if we as Christians began to think on who we are in Christ? And that's all we thought on. Who we are in Christ. We didn't think about the negatives the world labeled us with. We just thought on who we are in Christ. And that became all we thought on. Wouldn't that be a better thing to do? Focus on our time on who we are in Christ. Then there's this environmental determinism. And that's the belief that the environment, most notably as physical factors such as landforms and climates, determines the patterns of human culture and society de societal development. It can be broken down to a level in that you are what your environment determines you are. And we'll bring it down to a street level. That is what I am because of my surroundings of the influence that centered around me when I was growing up. How many times you heard people make a comment, so-and-so, they grew up on the wrong side of the tracks? Please don't ever make that comment. Do you realize you're looking down your nose at them that you're saying they're beneath you? Let me tell you what, in the church, now I know nobody here would do this, but in the church, there are church people that have walked up to somebody cleaning a hallway or a bathroom saying, well, you know, one of these days, God's going to really use you for something important. Let me tell you something. If you aren't willing to clean the toilet, God ain't going to use you for nothing. Don't put somebody down because they're doing a task that you think you're too good for. I know nobody here would do that. See, I didn't know I was brought up on the wrong side of the tracks. I really didn't. But Sue and I, we had the opportunity to go back and revisit some of the neighborhoods that I grew up in 
before the age of 12. And I found out that I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. I grew up on the pole side of the tracks. You know what the pole side of the track is? We were so poor, we couldn't afford the R. Seriously. I grew up on the pole side of the tracks. I was 11 years old, hanging out in pool halls, learning how to hustle and how to con people. I don't say that with pride. My father, my biological father, walked out when I was four years old, never to be seen or heard from again. My biological mother's trying to raise me on government income and what little bit of work she could get. And for 35 plus years, it played with my head. Did my dad leave because of me? Something I did. So that started affecting me. I found out later, I've always known my grandmother was a mean woman. I mean mean. I found out later that my biological father had come back and tried to see me a couple times. My grandmother was a very good friend with the sheriff at the time. And after my biological father had passed, I reconnected with that family. I found out the last time he came back to see me, Sheriff McDonald gave him a choice. Never come back or spend the rest of his life in prison. That's how mean and how corrupt my grandmother could be. And I loved her. But if she got, you got on the wrong side of her, that lady could be very powerful. So 12 years old, my mother passes away. And I'm adopted by an uncle and an aunt who became my parents. And thank God for them. But all of a sudden, I went from being an only child, a spoiled only child, a very spoiled only child, <laughs> to having seven brothers and sisters, and worse, a father who's an Assembly of God pastor. You talk about culture shock. Wow. I mean, that will mess with your head. And you know, you'd think I'd begin to change. You would think that that new environment, I'd start changing. What really happened is I only lived there for four years because I left home when I was 16. In that four years, I suppressed the real me. I put on a facade. So when I left home, my environmental determinism not only quickly resurfaced, but it came back with more of an effect on me than ever. And I will say this, thank God, you know, seed time and harvest? I will say this, the four years that I was in mom and dad's house, the word that was planted in me, the discipline that was planted with me, thank God it was because I am who I am today. It didn't affect me then, but it got in me. It would be years later down the road, it would all come back. But the time, I have to ask you a question. We know that things around you can affect you, but do you have to stay that way? No. No, you have opportunities to get out of that. By the time I was 18 years old, I was doing my first tour of Vietnam. My best friend was doing his first tour in Missouri State Prison. Had things not went the way they did and I ended up in a Christian home for four years, I'd have been there with him. I have no doubt. Now remember I said that it just, I suppressed it, it came back. I'm 17, not quite 18 years old. I got two FBI agents coming in the front door while we're going out the back door. Remember, I learned how to con. I learned how to hustle. I learned how to repair and hide stolen cars, too. But here's the fourth thing I want to talk about, and it's the most important one. Psychology doesn't teach you this. They won't talk about it. But there is this thing called in Christ determinism. Amen? Amen? In Christ determinism says I am in Christ and I am who Christ says I am. When you get to that point, the other three begin to fade away. The more you understand who you are in Christ, the more that begins to fade away. 
the more I began to understand that that guy was no longer there. I was a new creation. I had a choice on how I was going to live my life. My environment began to change. Now, I'm 21 years old, and I'm still not a nice person. Imagine my wife's married to me, and I'm not a nice person. What I was was very charming, very convincing, very much a con. When I first went into management, I had to go to school up in Chicago. One of the classes we had to take, it was under the pretense of the class, we spent a week with a psychologist. He's going to analyze us and figure out our strong points and how to make us better managers. First day of the class, he asked me who I thought it was. I said, I think I'm a child that's never going to grow up. He laughed. He goes, we'll see. At the end of that week, and he was done with the other 27 people, he tried to look at me. He goes, you're very dangerous. I said, what do you mean? He says, you have the ability to talk somebody out of the shirt off their back and sell it to them and make, they've got, make them think they got a good deal. He says, you're a kid that's never going to grow up. I said, didn't I tell you that a week ago? I just wasted a week of my time up here with you, didn't I? I don't say that was pride. But that's who I was. But this time, I got two kids at home. And they're growing up quickly, becoming teenagers. Reality is, in Christ, determinism should become stronger than any other factor in our life. Now, the things I did, and I'm like Pastor Rob back there. I'll tell you some of the things I did. There's some of the things you'll never know. Because it ain't none of your business. And it's things that I don't want to bring up and talk about. Not that it would change me or influence me. It's just things I really just don't want to talk about. It's things I'm not proud of. Things that happen. How many of you were in kids? My son doesn't have to raise his name because I know this happened to him more than once. How many of you when you were in school had a teacher publicly call you names and put you down? Tell you he's never going to be any good. Tell you that you were just a brat. Tell you whatever. Every negative comment planted a seed in your mind and helped shape your identity. My son, I went to a school, up to a uh, principal's office, and tried to have a conversation with him. And he belly butted me into another room and just stood there and blocked the door. And I told him very quickly, in no uncertain terms, you've got about three seconds to move. If you don't, I'm going to put my foot upside your head and drop you. And he didn't move. My wife looked at me and she said, Larry, he's not kidding. One of, the, one of the teachers was under the desk. He moved. I went straight to the dean's office and said, I will be back at 3 o'clock. I want to have a conversation with you. And this principal. This principal was making my son's life a living hell. We show up. And <laughs> it's not just me and this dean and this principal. He's got all of my son's teachers there. And all my son's teachers are sitting there going, I don't know what we're talking about. We don't have a problem with him. Do you know what kind of impact that had on my son? When in Christ's determination starts changing how you see yourself and who you are. Identification. I looked up a word identification. To consider or treat as the same the condition or act of being the same in all qualities under consideration. When you come into Christ and, and you put that into consideration, you become identical to Christ. Not that we're talking about the inside. We're talking about when you come into Christ, you're a new creation. And when Christ sees you, he sees you, or when God sees you, he sees you identical to his son. We're joint heirs. Isn't that what the word says? Well, if God sees me identical to his son, should I not see myself that way? So why do I walk around sometimes feeling inadequate? Feeling like I'm not qualified. It's because every day we still get bombarded 
But things in this world, in this environment, it tries to beat us down and tell us that we can't. We're not good enough for that. We're not qualified for that. What does the word say? Between the book of Acts and the book of Revelation, there are 130 scriptures that talk about in Christ, in Him, in whom, in the Lord. 130 scriptures that gives you your identity of who you are. And we're briefly just going to talk about it a little bit here. Well, we're going to get out here early today. Wherever the Bible says, or whatever the Bible says about you being in Him, the Bible is now telling you how you're identified in Him and what your identity is. Right, Pastor Vince? You could have Bobbin over there. <laughs> you know, there are promises that are legally yours. That book is full of promises that are legally ours. But if we don't know them, and we don't know about it, we can't claim it. Even though they're legally ours, we can't claim them if we don't know about it, right? The Bible lists everything that is legally yours. Every blessing, every promise. And once we know about it, we become aware of it, we still have one more step. We still have to step, step up and say, that's mine, I want it. Amen. If I don't grab hold of it, that's not going to do me any good. We have a legal identif identification in Christ that gives us legal rights to the blessings of the Bible. When I was born, and, and you know what, you too, when you were born, they created this legal document called birth certificate. It established the fact that you were a legal resident of this country, that you were born here to legal parents of this country. It also established your rights. What mom and dad had is mine. While I'm growing up, what mom and dad had is legally mine. What my father has is legally mine. But it's up to me to find out what he has that I want that's mine. But that legal birth certificate began to establish my legal rights and your legal rights. And when we got older, what was the next step that we wanted? Can't wait to be 16 and get my car. Got to get my driver's license. So you go to the DMV to take your test, and what's the first stinking thing they ask for? Your birth certificate. They got to have that legal docu document to establish another legal document that gives you the legal right to drive. We understand that. So then we grow up a little bit more and we decide that we want to purchase a new car, a house, or we just want to get on board an airplane and go somewhere. What's the first thing they ask for? Your driver's license, that legal identification. About anything you do anymore, except vote, you have to have that legal identification. You know, that banker may know me. It doesn't matter if he knows me or not. He still has to have that legal document to put on that application, or he can't do anything for me. In the book of Acts, Rob, go to Acts 19, verse 11 through 16. God was performing extra, extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body to the sick and the disease left them and evil spirits went out. But also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits in the name of Jesus. I adjourn you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. These were the seven sons of Siva. Now, isn't that dumb? That would be like Kim going out praying for somebody going, I beseech you in the name of Jesus that Pastor Bob preaches about. She don't know him. I mean, I know she does, but I'm just saying. These guys didn't know Jesus. 
But now they're trying to work the miracles using the name of Jesus that so-and-so's teaching. It don't work. The seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And the evil spirits answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus and I know about Paul, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirits leaped on them and subdued them and overpowered them. So they fled out of the house naked and woman, wounded. They did not know who Jesus was and they got their keisters kicked. They got them kicked so bad they got kicked out of clothes and had to run down the street naked. They were literally bearing off. See, they did this because they had no official identity. Jesus and Paul, the other disciples, they had established an identity in heaven, here on earth, and below the earth. The devil and his imps, they know who Jesus and Paul were. They know who they were. They didn't know who these other people were. Well, guess what? If you've truly been born again, if you really surrendered your life to Christ and you're, you're where you're supposed to be, you have an established identity in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Satan and those imps know who you are. Probably the youngest, and I'm not picking on him, I'm proud of him, Probably the youngest Christian in here would be Dustin. Dustin has an identity in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. The devil knows who Dustin is. And he's not happy about it. And when Dustin takes that identification and says, Hey, I got an identity card here that says I'm a child of the living God, the devil starts shaking. As Dustin grows spiritually, as all of us grow spiritually, because none of us are there yet, the more you grow, you hold that, up, that ID card, imps begin to run. They don't want to mess with you. Because they know who you are. You have that legal identity now. They know Christ followers. They know prayer warriors. I'm telling you what. I have seen times in the last 10, 11 years when that woman right there got to praying. And I guarantee you, there wasn't a devil within 100 miles coming in here. I'm serious. Every one of us experienced. There's times when she's been caught up in prayer, you walk past her and you just kind of stagger because you could feel the anointing so strong. They know who the prayer, war prayer warriors are. Betty has an ID card that said, I'm a child of the living king and I'm a mighty prayer warrior. And the imps are going, get away from her. We don't want to deal with her. So now that we know we have an official identity, what do we do with it? Now that we understand that we're identified in Christ, we've been made a brand new person, we're not who we used to be. What do we do with it? First, we begin to understand the position of our identification. Hey, excuse me, I think I got up an hour too early and still got cotton mouth. Amazing how one hour can mess you up, isn't it? Rob, Ephesians 2, 4, and 6, if you would, please, sir. But God... Being rich in mercy because of his great love, nothing we did, but because of his great love in which he loved us, even we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. Through grace we have been saved. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Because you are in Christ. You are seated in the heavenly places with him at the right hand of the Father. Now, there's a lot of people who don't understand, so put it to you, I'll put it to you this way. And we've all done this. You may be sitting here this morning. You're physically sitting here. But your mind 
is on something you got to do tomorrow. So you're physically here, but you're not here. Your mind's wandered off somewhere else. Understand? It's just kind of along the same principle. In the natural, we are here. In the natural, my physical body's standing here. In the supernatural, I'm sitting in heaven beside Jesus. That's my identity. That's who I am. I am seated in heavenly places. Paul said in Galatians 2.20... Go ahead, Rob. I'll let you go there. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live. Remember, we went back to the environmental thing. We become in Christ. The environmental thing doesn't matter anymore. That's not who we are anymore. Paul's saying, I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live. But it's Christ that lives in me and the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's some amazing idea right here, isn't it? I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. That's my identity. That's who I am. So what would happen if every day we confessed... I'm crucified in Christ. It's not me that lives anymore. It's Christ that lives through me. You know, we do all these confessions every day. That, you know, what every day, if we just took a moment to think, it's not me anymore. It's Christ that lives through me. Pastor Debbie keeps telling us that we have the mind of Christ, Diane. Okay. I'm a born-again believer. I'm a son of the living God. I have an identity. I have the mind of Christ. But it don't do me any good if I only pay attention to what this thing says and I don't take a moment or two to say, okay, Lord, I need your mind. How do we do this? I got the mind of Christ. But I got to connect with him if I want to think like him. If I keep trying to do it on myself. Remember Peter? He's out there in the middle of a storm. And here's Jesus walking by on the water, and it scares him. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, call me to come. Come here, Peter. Peter jumps out, and people go, Peter doesn't have much faith. Peter walked on water. He jumped out of a boat in the middle of a storm. He didn't jump out on a glassy lake. He jumped out in the middle of a storm. And he's walking to Jesus. And then his eyes gets on the storm, and he starts to sink. Now, we don't know. There's nothing that says how far he sank. When I think of he starts to sink, your head's underwater. You're that body that's starting to sink to the bottom. <laughs> you're done for, okay? That's my thinking. We don't know. Did he go ankle deep? Did he go knee deep? Did he go waist deep? Did he go over his head? There's no record that he called out for anybody to throw him a life jacket or a rope. The only record in there is his focus immediately got back on Jesus. He said, save me. Jesus put his hand down. Peter got a hold of it and come out. Did he get in the boat or did he just hold hands and walk the rest of the way across the lake? We don't know. But there's no record that Peter tried to do anything of himself other than save me. That's it. That's the only record we have. We have the mind of Christ. Sometimes we have to stop thinking what we would do. Start connecting with him and say, okay, Lord, what would you do? The purpose of identification, the identification. So why does God want you to have his identification? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, for a brand new life. You know, when you become born again, he gives you a brand new life. Your DNA changes. You have his DNA now. But the bigger reason is to walk in victory. I have an identification card in Christ that says I can walk in victory. It doesn't mean I'm not going to have battles. But it means when those battles come, I can take my position and authority Amen. and fight that battle knowing in advance I have the victory. Right. As long as I hang on to my identity and do what I'm supposed to do. You know, there's some situations that are no win. I mean, that are no, no way of losing. Bree's father, 
Iron Man. Man, what a testimony this guy has been. But do you realize that from the beginning, had God called him home, he still won. He still had the victory. What was the devil going to do? Devil was going to punish him by taking his life and sending him home to a better life? That don't make sense. But Rob knew his identity. And every time they'd come in there, with those reports about this is going to happen, that's going to happen, he'd just look up and I, you know, I could almost see him smiling. That ain't what I believe. And look what happened. For the last three or four years, how many times have each one of us been given a report we didn't like? And the first, one, first thing we seen was Rob going, ain't what I believe. That has been a tremendous blessing to me. That's helped build my faith. Because Rob understood his identity, who he is in Christ. And he held up that identification card and he goes, that ain't what I believe. First John 5, 4 says, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Our faith is what overcomes the world. Well, how do we get that faith? It starts with your identity. You have to identify who you are in Christ. When I put my faith in Jesus, or when you put your faith in Jesus, that's going to give you the victory to overcome whatever problem you face. Then there's the practice of identification. Rob, uh, Matthew 5.13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the salt. Understand that. You're the salt, because we're going to come back to that in a minute. Rob, go to Colossians 4, 2, 6. This is how we're going to practice our identification. Devote yourself to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I more may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise... In the way you act towards outsiders, make the most of every opportunity and let your conversations be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know the answer to everyone. Reality is, we are the church. Now, we know how we treat each other in here, but how do we treat people out there? Do you know what the salt is? It's your words. Is what you say. How you treat people, how you see people, and what you say to people. You can be salty, or you can be salty. Now, I was in the military, and most of you know I was in the Navy. You don't want to be an old salty dog. That's not a compliment. <laughs> It can have different meaning, believe me. He says, let your conversations always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer everyone. And be honest. If you could ask a question you don't know, don't be embarrassed to look up. Put the salt on it. Don't be embarrassed to look up and say, you know, I honestly don't know the answer right now, but I'll find out and get back to you. And then treat them right. Find the answer they want to know about and get back with them. When you're on social media posting something, have you ever asked if you're being salty in a good way or being salty in a bad way? i tell you what, I've seen some Christians... that need to stay off social media. I got some friends of mine and about once every three months, well, I got suspended for the next 30 days. 
You know why they got suspended? Not because they were saying anything. Not because they were using the name of Jesus. But they were using the name of Jesus in that post to put somebody down and beat him up. To be honest. And we see it happening all the time. People get on social media and they think they can say whatever to whoever, whenever. No. You got to talk to people on there even more careful than you do in public because you cannot express your emotion in social media. Matthew 5.14 said, We're not only the salt of the world, but we are the light of the world, and the town built on a hill cannot be hidden. So in the same way you let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify heaven, the Father in heaven, we're the only light people are going to see in this world. As Pastor Jack puts it, this world is not getting darker. This world is in gross darkness. Jeff, you were in the Navy. You were out to sea, I assume. He can back me up. I'm not lying. On a clear night, in the middle of the ocean, the end of a lit cigarette can be picked up five miles away. Just the end of a lit cigarette. Now, that little bit of light, imagine if you're the light and you walk into a room, you can drive darkness completely out. As Pastor Debbie puts it, you can be an uh, atmosphere changer. And people are watching us. We're the only light out here, and people are watching us because they're hungry. There, there was somebody I know, and I'm not going to mention the name. And trust me, I wanted to, I really wanted to get into a much deeper discussion. But the Holy Spirit kept saying, no, let it go, don't do it. There's a guy that posted something on Facebook last week. And actually what it said was, I saved myself $5 in gas money and stayed home from the Sunday morning social club. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian anyway. Okay? I agreed with him. No, you do not have to go to church to be a Christian. But you're cheating yourself out of that fellowship. You're cheating yourself out of the growth. You're cheating yourself out of the relationships. He immediately come back and don't come in here preaching. I don't want to hear it. I wanted to go back in there and say, look, dude. I really did. But it didn't. But what he did not realize he was saying, even though he thought that little sign was cute, which he didn't make. He got it from somewhere. What he's really saying is, I say five dollars. That five dollars is more important to me than going to church in the house of God. And then he turned around and took the church and brought it down to just a social club. Opportunity was there for me to go in there. Now this this person, my son knows him. This person is going through some family crisis right now that's got him a little. Let's just say stretched. But social media, it's not like it was when we was growing up and there was only three channels on TV. Today, man, you can say whatever you want. Get it all over the world real fast. We can make good remarks. We can make nasty remarks. Nobody here has ever made a nasty remark on Facebook or social media, have you? Don't you answer, Rob Martin. <laughs> I am, you know what, I'm really proud of Pastor Bob. Because Pastor Rob, about two years ago, we all know he will argue with himself. So imagine when he let go on Facebook when somebody went on a religious discussion. But God moved on him. He goes, no more, I'm not doing that. He don't argue on there anymore. Yeah, he knows he's right, so why argue? We can be the salt or the light. Or we can go where we really shouldn't go. Social media people are way too quick to share things that is cute now. You know what? <laughs> Some people need to pay attention to what they're posting about their families. Some things about your family is nobody's business. There are personal things between you and your wife I don't need to know about. 
There's personal things about you and your kids I don't need to know about. I know one lady that posted on there about her teenage daughter was moving into womanhood. I don't need to know that. And it's, you know, oh, this is so cute. Ten years from now, that little girl's going to look at that and go, Mom, that wasn't so cute. That was embarrassing. You know, social media, you need to be the salt. You need to be the light. So here's a challenge. I'm going to close with this. Watch yourself closely and be truthful to yourself. Are you being salt with what you say? Are you being light with how you act? I know the world's trying to pray, place perimeters around us as to what we can and cannot say. But they can't stop us from being salt and light. See, you get on social media, you go to the grocery store. You don't have to say Jesus every time you talk to somebody to be salt and light. Sometimes just complimenting somebody. Sometimes just taking a moment to talk to somebody that's really feeling kind of down and beat up. Is all you need to be the salt or the light. If you go to work and you've got somebody that's just really unlovable. I didn't want to look at anybody over there, but I thought of it. But you go in there every day. And you love the unlovable. Doesn't matter what they do to you. It's what you do to them. You go in there every day and you're the salt and you're the light. Before long, people start sitting there going, what's with them people? They're always happy. They don't get upset. I've been mean to these people and they're always nice to me. And it starts opening a door to where the person you thought was unlovable, you look up and say, can I pray for you? And that person says, would you please? You don't have to say Jesus just to be salt and light. You can set the seeds in your actions and things you do. It gets someone interested and they want to know what's different to you. And you can step outside those perimeters and there's nothing they can do. So if we're nice to people who do bad things, and we start loving the unlovable, if we really are the salt and the light, are we not doing what we're supposed to do? Are we not showing our identity of who we are? Now, there's so much more in identity we could get into. You want to find out more about the identity? Take the class believer of the authority. That's another one that will help you out. I've had it three times. I'm enjoying it as much this time as I did the first time. It's a refresher of who I am. It's reminding me of the authority that I have. It's making me see all you people differently. Not that I've ever seen you in a bad way. But it's making me appreciate you more. The uniqueness and the quality and the things that you have to offer this body. So my challenge this week is pay attention to how you're talking to people, how you're treating people, and ask yourself the question, Am I really being the salt? Am I really being the light? Am I really holding up my identification card for the world to see who I am? Amen? Amen. Did you get anything out of this? Yes. Next week, Pastor, or, or next week, Pastor Bob will not be back. Uh, Rob and Kim will be speaking next week. We look forward to that. Uh, I don't know how much Rob will get to say, but... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Kim, I couldn't help but do that.